Those of you who are here and those of you who are watching online, tonight we're going to get started with a song not in the book, but this song's been around since at least the 1500s, so hopefully you've had time to learn it. It's Be Thou My Vision. <clears throat> Be Thou My Vision Let's go to our Father together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, and I've said it once and I said it before, again and again and again. We are such a blessed people here in this congregation, Father. We are your children, and what a privilege it is to be called a child of God. Help us not to take that for granted, um, although we may at times forget. And we're grateful for these times where we can come together to remember who you are. You're gracious, you're loving, you're merciful, and you are just. And we know, Father, that um, you are with us always. Always with us, all we need to do is reach out and ask we come before you, Father. Some of us lay our burdens at your feet. Our troubles are many, but our blessings overpower those troubles because your promise is that we will be home with you someday in that sky up above us. Father, as we continue this service this evening, help us to forget what is out in the world beyond these doors for the short time that we're here and help us to focus on you, help us to focus on your word and help us to be there for each other who are in need and help us to lift up each other, to encourage because these days are long, Father, and they're hard. And um, we just want to say that we love you. In Jesus' name I do pray, amen. Six hundred fifty two. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land. Climb the seas and cross the waves. Onward is our Lord's command. Save, Jesus saves, walk it on the rolling tide. 
take a few minutes to chat with you this evening. You know, there's a, it, I'm, I'm sure it's always been this way, but I think as the, the knowledge, biblical knowledge decreases more and more as time goes on in the States. And, uh, you know, several years ago, maybe 40 years ago, the people who knew about God and believed in God was like 80% in the U.S. <clears throat> now it's down to about 20, the recent polls. So it's, it's, it's seen a, a huge decline. And every now and then uh, on YouTube, I'll see campus ministers, and they're talking to college kids and just in basically general stuff. And the, the one question that keeps coming up is uh, about Jesus. And, and basically, they'll say, prove to me that he's God. So they don't, they don't see Jesus as, as God. You know, if you look at the religious world in general, Islam doesn't believe that Jesus is God. He was, I think, for the most part, a prophet. Uh, even in their writings, uh, once you get into them, they had, they had respect for him as as a man of God, but not God. If you look at uh, Judaism, they, they consider Jesus a, a, a rabbi. Some will go so far as to say a prophet, but that's it. They're still waiting on the Messiah. They're still waiting on God's son. If you look at uh, other uh, Christian organizations like Jehovah Witnesses, who I have personally studied with, and they stop short of declaring that Jesus is God. They just think he was a son of God. And I was like, well, what do you mean? How, how do you mean that? You know, when someone says that, I think it's something like Hercules, right? He had, a, he had Zeus, a, a Greek god, as a father and a, a, a human mother. So he was kind of a hybrid, half-breed, not really God, not really human kind of person. And says, so, is that what you mean? He's like Hercules? And they go, oh, well, no, no, we, we hold him in higher regard than that. I'm, I'm like, well, what do you mean higher regard? You're not considering him who he is, who he claimed to be, was, was God in, in the flesh. You're denying that. You're calling God a liar. And, and, and sometimes that takes them back because I don't think they actually thought it through that far, which, which causes me to scratch my head. So... When someone says to you, you know, uh, where does it say in the Bible? And that was one of the questions that often came up. Where does it say in the Bible that Jesus is God? I'm, I'm thinking they really don't know. There's many places. We've been studying in John, right? It's over and over again in John. But especially in, in, in John 1, first chapter, uh, John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you're thinking, scratching your head, going, well, you know, who's this word thing? And it, but it says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He became as a witness to bear a witness about the light. All that might believe through him, he was not the light, but came to bear witnesses about the light, 
The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, were given the right to become the children of God. Wow. The children of God. This is, this is the thing that I think drove, continues to drive Satan and the demons absolutely out of their mind. Because you know they're not or never were known as the children of God. We have a very, very unique position with, with God. We have a position with God that no other creature that was created by God has or ever will have. I, I sometimes, it renders me speechless to think about that position that we have, that the believers have, those who have accepted Jesus have, those who have, are obeying, not have obeyed, but are obeying our Lord Jesus, are known as his children, the God who created the universe. That, that is just, gives me goosebumps to even stand here and say that. And for us to reject that, how foolish is that for those that, that reject that? Look what they're walking away from. Look what they're associating with in this world. Associating, rejecting their own family, the family of God, and turning to evil and, and Satan. I would hope I'm glad that God's patient so that all could hear and, and come to the point where they could believe. He's very, been very patient with me, and I'm sure many, all of you feel the same way. But what I may want to make you aware of this evening is what our position is if we obey God. We're his children. And if you need proof of who Jesus was, First John's a great place to start. In fact, the whole book of John is a testimony about who Jesus is, the Son of God. If there's any way that we can uh, study with you, if you'd like to study or, or need our prayers, uh, please come forward while we sing a, a song of encouragement. If you're out there online and you want to know more, uh, please just give us a call or, or, or a, come and attend with us and worship with us, and we'll, we'll uh, study with you and, and try to help you through this. So, it's an invitation is open now. Uh, please stand as we sing. Here I lay.
Trahan, she's she's back from her trip. I guess they went all out there to visit visit family. And since she got back, she's not been feeling well at all and doesn't seem to be getting any better. So uh, we want to keep Dottie in our prayers, and we'll pray for, for her in a moment. Also got a request here from Darlene. Uh, her her uh, manager and their family are on, a, on an extensive vacation in Hawaii, but, uh, you know, Dottie, uh, Darlene wants to make sure that they're safe and get back get back home safely. So... Let's, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we pray uh, for many things, but now we want to bring a, a couple of concerns before you. We want to pray for our sister Dottie and that uh, she's able to figure out what's ailing her and get better. We so much love her and enjoy her when she's here, and she's a vital part of our family. Father, we pray that you would uh, take take note of her illness, and Father, that it would be your will that she would uh, be well again and be able to be with us. And also, uh, uh, with Darlene's management team and their families, they're, they're on a long journey, uh, and, and sure enough, it's, it's a vacation, but still dangers arise, and, and in so unpredictable world, we pray, Father, for their safety and their safe return. And Father, we pray for the church here, and that the blessings will, will continue to, uh, to come our way. We thank you so much for your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
I'm always ready. Good evening, everyone. Welcome into our study of John. I will try not to go on a tangent from what Barry was talking about, because if you wonder where it says Jesus is God, read the book of John. I beg you, read the book of John. It's in there. It's, it's all throughout the New Testament. It is something you have to really try to ignore if you're reading through. So, lots in John. We'll do a little bit of rabbit chasing tonight for that. But we'll get started with prayer as we always do. So, let us pray. Our Father in Heaven, it truly is an honor to call you Father. And it is an honor because we are not natural-born children of yours. We are adopted because you have been willing to take us. You have been willing to reconcile despite our misdeeds and our failures and our sins. And indeed, you even offered the sacrifice that allowed it to be possible. And we are so grateful for that. And we are grateful for those who have chosen to be part of your family because it is an honor to choose and to be loved willingly, because, Lord, we all have a desire to be loved and to love others. So we pray for those who have not chosen to be a part of your family, that they would get to know you and what kind of father you are, that they would get to know Jesus and what type of brother he is, and to know that you reign in this world, and to know that we share in that as Christians, that if we overcome we too will get to sit on the throne. It is a wonderful thing to be a part of your family, especially for those of us who did not have good families growing up, even those who don't have great families today. And we know, Lord, that we can't choose which physical family we're born into, but thanks be to your name that we can choose to be part of the spiritual family that spreads across this globe and that one day we'll reside in the mansion above that you are preparing for us. We pray that we take that seriously tonight as we study through John 8. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So here in John, uh, we're actually going to start off kind of with what Barry was talking about. Just in John chapter 20, we'll read verses 30 and 31. And if you want, you can also turn over to 1 John chapter 5 as we'll look at a couple of verses there. But this is where we started our study in the book of John. It says, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is, or Jesus is the Christ, and he is the Son of God. And that believing, you may have life in his name. So the whole purpose of the book of John is to believe in Jesus, to believe he is the Son of God, to believe he is the Christ or the Messiah, and the result of that is to have life. And we'll take a look at that in 1 John chapter 5 as well, because you might ask yourself, well, why is it that Jesus has life? Why is he the one who gives us life? And it says in 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse number We'll start at verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe has made God a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. All of this is very relevant 
end of John chapter 8 where we have been. It's also relevant in John chapter 5 where we were before. But what is, the, what is the statement John is making? What's the connection between the Son of God, belief, and life? All the same. They're pretty much the same, right? So, if you believe in the Son of God, what do you receive? Life. If you don't believe in the Son of God, what do you receive? Death. It's that simple. People who are black and white like me love that. It's either life or death. There's no in-between. And it all hinges on believing that Jesus is the Son of God. So, this whole book in John is talking about how we can know that Jesus is the Son of God. But also, if Jesus is the Son of God and Jesus claims that he is God, are we to believe him? Yeah. He says, I'm God. Well, you better believe that. Right? And according to John, especially places like John 3 where we've read, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? How would we define that? Eternal life. All right. It will give you eternal life if you believe. But what does it mean to believe? How does John define that? It's pretty much compelled you to certain deeds in certain ways. Okay. So it is accepting something as true, right? That's what we typically say, like, oh, I believe you. That means I'm accepting what you say is true. But more than that, it is driving your actions because of that. So inherently, in the word belief, when John says you have to believe in the Son of God, that means you have to accept what he is saying is true, and you have to act on it. So when, you know, Jesus says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, and you need to go into the world baptizing and making disciples of every nation, you have to do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and then you have to teach them to obey all things that I have commanded you, is obeying important? Absolutely. So, if you are not obeying, what does that mean about your state of belief? Okay. You don't truly believe. You are looking at the surface part of it, just as the many people who enjoy seeing the miracles that Jesus performed mm -hmm. and let it go and did not change their lives. Yes. So it means you don't believe. If you are not obeying, you are not believing. Now here, here's the nuance to that, right? You can still accept mentally the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. And you can accept that he died for your sins and you can accept that he is in heaven right now and that he's going to come back but you don't really believe unless you're obeying. You can accept that stuff as truth, but that's not the Bible's definition of belief. And that is integral to what we're talking about here in John chapter 8. We have been talking in verses 31 through about 37 last week. We're going to hopefully finish the chapter tonight. But the, the real summary of this whole part of John 8 is, who is your father? And how do you know? So according to John, can we know whether or not we are saved and have eternal life? Yeah, John says you can know that you have life. How do we know that? By the Holy Spirit, which should be residing in us. All right, Holy Spirit that's in us, that's a good part of it. What's the other simple part of it? To continue in the Word. If you continue, right? Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Set you free from what? We'll read tonight. Death. So it will give you life. You will know the truth. The truth will give you life. So abiding in the words of Jesus will give you life. 
So as long as you believe in Jesus by accepting who he is and obeying that, you can know that you are saved. Does that also mean you can know if you're not saved? Yes. Then how do you know you're not saved? Very simple answer, very simple question. Don't know why you're supposed to do You don't abide in the word. It's that simple, right? It says in this Bible, in that John, first John, um, mm -hmm. that if you don't know the it in your heart, then you've made a liar out of God. Right. And God has um, like known he, well, God knows that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and that, that's the interesting thing, right? That God the Father witnessed to the fact that Jesus is his son. So if God the Father says, hey, this Jesus character, he's my son, and I'm pleased with him, and you need to listen to him, and you just say, you know what, I really don't think Jesus is the son of God. Now, what you've just done is you've taken the witness of God the Father himself, and you've said, now, nah, he's lying. He's not really telling me the truth that Jesus is his son. Something else must be the case. So, if you don't believe Jesus is the son of God, then you do make God a liar. Because he said Jesus is his only begotten son. So, all of that's very important. Now, how do we apply this? to these Jews here in John chapter 8. Because they surely knew that they were saved. They knew they were God's people, but does Jesus say they were really God's people? What do we make of this? How do we apply this? Well, they're sinners, so they're slaves. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we're talking about slavery in the context, and we're talking about knowing the truth and being set free. And, of course, they say that, well, we have never been in bondage to anyone. So that's a lie in every respect of that word, and Jesus goes on to talk. But notice, as we have read last week, and let's say verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my Father. Again, there's Jesus claiming to be the Son of God. And you do what you have seen with your Father. And they answered, Abraham is our Father. Jesus says to them, if you were Abraham's children, what would you do? You do the works of Abraham. It's that simple, right? If you were really his kids, you would do the things that he did. So they thought they were saved, but the problem is, is they were not doing the works of the man they thought was their father. Now physically, of course, they were descendants of Abraham. Cannot be denied. They were Jews. They came from the same family physically. But spiritually, they were doing anything but the word of God. Because how would Abraham have felt, according to Jesus, if Jesus were to talk to him? That he did everything that he was supposed to do? Yeah. Abraham would have believed him. Abraham, there's no way he would have thought about killing the Savior. Because he would have listened and he would have obeyed. But really, it all comes down to this in society today. You can tell who's a Christian and who's not a Christian by what they do. Um, this may be shocking to some of you, but people lie. And uh, religious people lie as well sometimes. And people act righteous sometimes when they're in the building. And then when you see them outside the building, guess what? They don't speak that way. They don't act the same way. Sometimes they're pretending, right? Pharisees, great example of this. Did they make a show in public of how religious they were? Yes, they did. Were they consuming widows' houses on the back end? Yes, they were. They were evil, but they pretended to be good. So you can tell a lot by what someone does rather than what they say. 
And in this case, the Jews were doing the works of their father. And who does Jesus say their father is in the text? Satan. The, Satan, the devil. And what two things does Jesus mention in the text that make them children of the devil? Did it have to do with the Oh, well, that's part of it, but not in this particular text. He was a murderer and a liar. He's a murderer and a liar. How does that apply to the Jews here? They're doing the same thing, right? They are not accepting the truth of what Jesus is saying, and they're trying to kill him because it's easier to kill him than to believe that what he's saying is true. So... They are not doing the works of God because, simple question, right? How does God feel about Jesus? He loves him. He loves him. He approves of him. He's behind him. He's given him all this power, all this authority. So God accepts him. The fact that the Jews don't obviously meant that they were not children of God. Because if they were, they would accept him just like the Father. Uh, you ever known somebody who brought someone around you that you're not familiar with and you're like, I can vouch for this person, they're a good person, it's okay for them to be here. And you're like, okay, well, because I trust you, I trust your judgment of this other person. It's the same way with God. If you trust God the Father, then you would trust the witness that he gave of Jesus being his son. The Jews thought they knew God the Father, but because they didn't accept this testimony, they were proving that they didn't really know him. So we'll continue reading here in John chapter 8 in verse 40, and Jesus is very clear that you would do the works of Abraham if you were his children, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. There's no way Abraham would do this. So you're not acting like Abraham's kids, Jesus says. You do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, and now we'll look at this, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. So, again, what happens when you're laying some hard truth on somebody and their first instinct is to react by insulting? You insult them back? Oh, we shouldn't insult them back. Well, your first instinct is to defend yourself? It can. Now, here's the thing I've learned. And if you do a lot of research in psychology and just be around people long enough, you see this. If you are making a lot of good points to somebody and they don't have a good answer back, usually they come back at you with name calling because they can't answer the questions you're asking. They can't you know, disagree with it because it's true, so they just start with name calling. Because if they can assassinate your character, what does that mean about your words? It means I don't have to believe you. If I can convince myself that you're a liar or you're a bad person, then it means I can discount everything you're saying. And, I mean, sometimes when we just run out of things to say, we go to insults because we've got nothing left. And that's really what the Jews are doing here in this text. Alex? The Pharisees have been doing it throughout the entire book. Every time Jesus says something and someone believed it, they essentially called them a fool or an idiot or something along yeah. those lines for believing them. They've been trying to do it the entire time just to get people to stop listening to them. Yeah, they've already accused Jesus of having a demon. They're going to accuse him again of that later. They're going to accuse him of being a Samaritan. And, and just know this might be a dig at the birth of Jesus, right? Because some people were a little bit unsure who the father of Jesus was because they knew it wasn't Joseph. So when they say we are born of fornication, well, that might mean that they're thinking Jesus was. And that that makes him illegitimate because in the text what he's doing is he's calling them illegitimate. Not physically, but spiritually. And the comparison earlier in the chapter was to Ishmael, who was a physical descendant of Abraham, came from his loins, but 
Even though he was a physical descendant, he did not do the things Abraham would do, therefore he was cast out of the house. He was also a bondservant, like his mother. So the servant doesn't stay in the house, but the son does, and the son has the ability to set you free, which is what we talked about last week. So they are saying that they have one father. Great argument, supposedly, but Jesus comes back and says in verse 42, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. And consider that for a moment, because we often talk about Jesus willingly going to the cross. And yes, he willingly went to the cross, but who sent him in the first place? God did. God the Father said, you need a sacrifice in order to forgive all of your sins because the animals won't work. I'm going to send that sacrifice to save you. And they're saying, God, you did not send this man. He is not our sacrifice. But he was. And God has testified to that this whole time. Because even like Barry was saying, when you take somebody like Hercules and all of the things he did with his labors and his half-god status, uh, what was Jesus going around doing that might make others think he came from God? He was doing lots of miracles, things that could not be denied, power that normal people don't have. So really the two choices are he either came from God or he came from some sort of false god or demon. Because no regular man can have that power, so you have to have it from somewhere else. But he says he came from God, and that God sent him. And just notice the frustration in verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? And here's the question. Has Jesus been mincing words with these people? No. Is anything he's saying unclear? No. But he says, you cannot hear me. You are not able to listen to my words. Now, here's the question. Why are they not able to listen to his words? They're from the devil. They're of the devil. Yeah. As long as they remain in their current state, they are not really going to understand the words of Jesus. Paul talks about this as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in other places where it says that the fleshly people cannot understand the spirit because the flesh is at odds with the spirit. So as long as we are fleshly, we'll never, ever accept what the spirit has to say. We have to be more spiritual than that. And part of this was God's doing because he needed them to kill Jesus. And it's not something they couldn't come back from because many of them were saved after. But in this moment in time, they were unwilling and unfit to hear his message. So then he really goes into them in verse 44. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Here's the thing Jesus claimed, if you abide in my words, you will have truth. You will know truth, and the truth will set you free. Because they were not listening to truth, they had to be listening to error. They had to be listening to lies. And in this case, it's really interesting that his claim is, you are more interested in lies than you are in the truth. And I'm sure all of us know at least one person who would rather be lied to than be told the truth in our own lives. It happens all the time. But Jesus says, because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. And here's where it really hits the road. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? 
That's the question. What sin could they convict Jesus of? What did Jesus do wrong at any point up to now? He had done nothing wrong. And if he had done nothing wrong, if he had not sinned, could he have lied? No, if he hadn't sinned, you can't lie. So if he hadn't lied about anything he said, then it must be true that he is the Son of God, and it must be true that he's telling the truth. And they can't point to a reason why. Sure, they can say they didn't like his words against them. Sure, they can say they didn't like that he healed people on the Sabbath. Sure, they can say you made yourself equal to God and that's blasphemy. But only if any of those things were not true. But the claim that Jesus is God and is God's son is very true. Was... One of the biggest mistakes they made is the fact that they essentially admitted he did no wrong by trying to purposefully trap him in wrongdoings multiple times over. Absolutely. And they sent other people to try and do it too. He yeah. didn't fall for it. They had to get false witnesses even at his trial because they didn't have any real grounds to stand on. And even Pilate, when he's talking about Jesus, he understood that Jesus was delivered over because of the envy of the Jews, not because he did anything wrong. So there's a lot that if Jesus is telling the truth, that makes all the difference in the world. But here's also where it separates out today. If you believe in Jesus in the Bible, you believe truth. If you believe anything else, it's not true. It's really that serious. And it's really that simple. Are there other religions out there that have some good teachings? Yeah. Is it true? Nope. Is it true in as far as it agrees with what the Bible says? Yeah. I've noticed that a lot in psychology. A lot of the things that work in psychology, wouldn't you know, they're based right in the Bible. And then the parts that don't tend to work, that's where they start straying from the Bible into whatever person came up with the theory. So the Bible really does have all the truth and all of the answers, but it is good to know that Jesus says, if I'm telling the truth, then why don't you believe me? It says, he who is of God hears God's words, therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. You're not really God's children, so you don't really hear what he has to say. That is a damning accusation of God's people in this text. That's like someone saying, you're not really a Christian because you're not acting like one. That would hurt for us to hear, especially if it was true. And that's why the Jews respond the way they do in verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? You've got both. You're wrong, Jesus. And it's just really funny to me that in the text, Jesus says, you don't believe me because you can't hear this. And their first response is, you're a liar. In your truth. They weren't willing to accept it, so we start calling Jesus' names and start saying he has a demon, so we don't have to listen to what he has to say. And Jesus answers them in verse 49. He says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. And if you're dishonoring Jesus, what does that mean about how you're treating the Father? You're dishonoring the Father, and you're doing that because the Father sent the Son. So very important there. And this is another reason why Jesus says in verse 50, And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Is that a question? So Jesus says here that I do not seek my own glory. What's the importance of this in the context? How does that help us understand who Jesus is? He gives all the glory to God. What's important about that? Now, he does what God tells him to do. He's the truth of what God wants us to know. Right? Let's, see, let's go even simpler. What does it mean if a person is seeking glory for themselves? Alex? It's not for God. Yeah, that's for sure. It's not for God. So, if Jesus was trying to be a messianic pretender, 
And let's remember, there were lots of people who pretended to be the Messiah. Your goal would be to institute an earthly kingdom, to be the king of that kingdom, and to have people under you treating you as the king. Now, did Jesus have people who wanted to make him king? Yeah, John chapter 6, they were going to force him to be king, right? Could he have stormed the gates and done all of those things? Yes, he could. All the healings he did, could he have taken all the credit for that because he's the one who did it and gotten very popular? Yes, he could have. But every single thing he did was not to elevate himself, not to put himself in the high spot. It was to elevate and glorify God the Father. And that's one way you can know he's telling the truth, because it wasn't about him ever. It was always about the Father. Alex? Um, the, the, sorry, she distracted me. The, the important thing to remember is that a lot of people will do things subtly to try and make it sound like they're not doing it for themselves. Like when you thank them for something, they'll just say, you're welcome. Or they'll be like, oh, no need for thanks. But instead of even just doing that, he was saying, your faith healed you. Or, you know... God has done this for you, or yeah. because of your faith, he never once just said thank you, he never once just went, yeah, you know, don't worry about it, he always pointed out that it wasn't him, it was their faith, it was God, it was... Yes, he's always pointing to God, which is most important, and it's interesting, and we're, we're not going to finish the chat, from, so, but in this context here, this is such an important verse in verse 51. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. That goes back to what Jesus said about knowing the truth. The truth shall set you free. What does it set you free from? And the answer is death. You'll never taste death. If you know the truth, you obey the truth. Now, again, let's contextualize this. Does Jesus mean if you believe in him, you'll never physically die? No. No, because he came to give eternal life, spiritually. Not physically, because the mortal cannot inherit the immortal. It's a very easy concept to understand, logically sound as well. So he says, if you believe me, you will never see death. And this is important in verse 52. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, they're dead as well. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death death. That's a sound argument. You say all of these wonderful things, Jesus, but all of the great fathers of the faith, the great prophets of the faith, they're all dead. Even David is dead. What are we going to do? And they say there in verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? And this is the key. If it's true that Jesus' words will keep us from seeing death, then he has to have something greater than anyone else. Because anyone else who ever interacted directly with God, be it Abraham, be it Moses, be it any of the prophets, they all died and none of them could keep anyone else alive. And just like we talked about with the bread, the manna, Moses gave bread to people who still died. Jesus claimed to give them bread that would keep them alive forever, so he must, must be greater than all of them. And what is greater than all of the greatest people in the world? In your faith, it means you have to be more than a man. Even with all of the prophets, though, God never promised them eternal life. He promised them children as many as the sand. He promised, you know, women that were barren to have children. He promised... You know, a kingdom, he promised victories in battle, but Jesus was the first one that through him you got eternal life. He was the first one God ever made that promise to, so no matter who came before him, that wasn't the promise that they were given to give out. Yeah. So, the question is, who do you make yourself out to be, Jesus? And you know what? Actually, if we stay one minute, we can finish this thing. Jesus says in verse 54, If I honor myself, my honor is not. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. 
And the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? So there is a little bit of uncertainty as to what this section means and how Abraham saw his day and all of that, but they did get the simple meaning. Jesus says, Abraham saw my day. So they're like, okay, Abraham died about 2,000 years ago, and you're saying that he saw you? You're not even 35, Jesus. How could you have crossed paths with Abraham? And that's going to tie into who is Jesus. Jesus said to them in verse 58, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. It is the name that God revealed for himself to Moses in the burning bush in the book of Exodus. It is the name God uses for himself in Isaiah. Jesus says, I am. You want to know where Jesus claims to be God? Right here. I am. Not I was, not I will be, but I am. He is claiming the very title and status of God in this passage. How do we know that? He's using the same name, right? What's their response? They took him up to stone him. Why would they stone him if they didn't understand what he meant? That he was blasphemous. Yeah, they thought he was blaspheming because he was claiming to be God. And see, this is what people in modern times don't understand. They say, well, where did Jesus claim to be God? Right here. How do we know? Because the people who were supposed to stone those who claimed to be God were trying to stone him because he claimed to be God. They knew exactly what he meant. Now, of course, he didn't need to be stoned because it was true. He's not lying. But he did claim to be God. They understood he was claiming to be God. And that is why they tried to kill him. And just to tie it back in with the beginning of chapter 8, the same group of people who walked away from the adulterous woman who had done something wrong and who could not throw the stones because of what they had done had no problem picking up stones in the middle of a feast where the Romans would have been, though it was illegal to kill with the Jewish laws in place because of the Romans, and they were willing to disregard all of that, break all of those laws, and stone Jesus on the spot, despite the fact that he had done nothing wrong. All because they understood he was claiming to be God, and they did not want to accept it. He was telling them the truth, they refused to listen, and they called him a liar because of it. And that is the biggest challenge in our society today, getting people to understand that we have sinned, that God is real, and that Jesus is the sacrifice that leads us to him, and he's the only way there, because he's the only one who can give us life. These people were blind. And as we get into John 9 next week, it's a whole chapter on blindness, both physical blindness and spiritual blindness. And it all comes down to, do you really see who Jesus is? Because when directly asked who he made himself out to be, he said, I am. Do we believe that? Because if we do, we'll receive life. If we don't, we'll receive death. It's that black and white, and it's that simple. So that'll wrap us up for John 8 tonight. Thank you so much for being here. And we do have one prayer request as we end. From Denisa, please pray for Gary. The van was hit and a lot of damage was done, but he is okay. So, you know, that's an important thing. We'll go ahead and pray for him. We'll end our class. Our Father in heaven, we do come before you and we recognize the fact that you are God and that your son Jesus, he is God and he is our Savior. You sent him for us that we could be saved, and you sent him into this world because you loved this world. But Lord, you also ask us to change, to repent, and to stop our sinful ways. Help us to accept the truth of the message, that we may live in the light of eternal life, and that we may glorify you as Jesus glorified you. Help us to understand that we only truly know you if we believe Jesus was your son, 
Not anyone who claims to know you yet disregards this does not really know you. Help us to be those who do your works and make it evident that we are your children, rather than doing the works of the devil and being children of his. Help us to choose righteousness in all situations. Be with Gary and be with Denisa and their situation with the van. We're glad that he's safe, Lord, and we thank you so much for the protection that you give us. Help us always to love each other because we know it's commanded, we know it's needed, and we know it's the example that you left us behind. Be with us as we go from here and bring us back safely this weekend so we may worship you to give you honor and glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. We'll be in John 9 next week.